I've been like pumping out the short videos lately, one by one. A lot of the reason I'm doing it is in response to um, the discussions I'm having in my comment section. Hey, Vaughn. Hey, John. Uh, I want you to be successful. If you're if you're not bow makers right now, or you've made a few and you haven't had the greatest results, I want you to be successful. There's nothing more frustrating than trying something and trying, and it just you know it doesn't seem to work out right. If if we were right here together in the same spot and we were working like on my shaving bench here, um, I would be able to help, you know, um, stop you from doing some maneuver that's going to like, with one swipe of your farrier's rasp or one swipe of your knife, ruin all your work. Because stuff like that can happen. If you were here, you know, we could certainly, and this is what I do when I'm teaching people, how to make the typical long bow, 68 inches long I think this is, narrow deep handle. Because um, there's a lot of fine work in the tillering that goes into this. However, in YouTube land, although I encourage you to watch Billy Berger's series on making a primitive bow and then Mike Yancey's um, Master Bowmaker series because they do a great job. Unlike me, they know how to edit. I want you to be successful. And I think the key into that is simplifying and shortening. Now, if I was to say, you know, um, this is the best bow regardless of the type, I would be a fool because there is a best bow for each purpose, really, a, a best style. And then within that purpose, there's a lot of options that you have. So there is no best bow. The best bow actually is the bow that works. My first successful bow I made, this is dating back to the age of the dinosaurs, it was made from just a, a hickory sapling, and I split it so I had two short pieces. Um, one piece formed one limb, one piece formed the other limb, and then I took a section of the split that I didn't use and then just bonded those two things together with sinew. And this is hickory inner bark and then brain tanned leather right there. And that's actually just the inner bark that's split. The wood is actually intact. So this is still a working bow after like a thousand years. Simple. Now you don't have to do the same thing by splitting something and then bonding them together in the handle. You could just split something and, and, and have a bow. This one still functions. It's pretty reasonable tiller and hickory is tough and forgiving so it worked well with me. But I'm going to add a little wrinkle to this. Now this is about 48, no this is about 52 inches long. It's a little longer than this. This is 48 inches which is a representative actually on the higher side, of the horse bows that were used on the plains all the way from, you know, the, the northern edge of uh, the U U.S. down south, you know, with the Comanche. Um, the northern plains, usually seen you back, the Comanche were self bows made out of Osage Orange. But they were all short, they were all effective, they could all drop bison, which is a testament to their um, functionality. Now, gull wings. This is a simple way that you can do. If you were to take a small sapling, and you can see this. This is like less than two inches in diameter. Very easy to work, easy to split. You almost have a bow. You've got a little bit of scraping to do. Now, to shape it into a gull wing, wet is simple. You could either just shoot that bow until it gets string follow and then steam bend the, the handle and then set it back and voila you eliminated all the string follow, or you could do it immediately. Now what I've found, whether or not it's a gull wing shaped bow, or like the Comanche where it was flat and then, and then had deflex in the limb, kind of like my spruce limb, but slightly different angles, that for some reason, some mysterious magical reason, the, the fineness of the tillering job um, starts disappearing in its need, because when you start bending the limbs in this way, it, it has this weird effect that the tillering is less critical. And so this will help you even further in your journeys as a bow maker. <clears throat> now there were gull wing bows that were unbagged. Take a sapling, um, get string follow, and um, set back the handle because you were clever. You left it a little thicker here. So it's actually not flexing as much through the handle as it is here, so you can get away with having a self-bow gull wing. Um, 
if you have the Comanche style, which is flat and then has a little deflex in it. Um, you could also shape that by just turning this, this um, raw bow upside down, lashing it along here, and then blocking up the tips and letting it dry like that. Now, you don't need to use seasoned wood, obviously. Um, a lot of people throughout the world started with green wood because it's easier to work, and then just let it dry. If you get a bow to these rough dimensions, let's say it's not fully tillered, you can just block it here, um, let it dry in the wind and the sun, and it would be down to its proper moisture level depending on your um, circumstances within a couple of weeks. You could actually whip out a whole bunch of these things, block them up, and then just like forget about them. And, you know, you'd have like a series of bows that you did kind of production line. They don't take up much space because they're short. And there you go. Sinew backing. Now, these definitely do, um, you know, benefit from sinew backing. And it doesn't need to be like fine work. This is a nice smooth layer I put on this, but I didn't do my super fine work because usually I'll take gauze. After I sinew back it, I'll let it dry a little bit, like in a couple hours, and then I'll take gauze very carefully and, and wrapping it. And this does a couple things. It squeezes out excess glue because glue is white, and it also allows that sinew to kind of slide along and then smooth out. So when I take, if you've ever seen one of my sinew back bows in person, it'll almost look like it was sanded, but it still has the look of raw sinew because my bows are this just side of perfect because I'm so careful when I um, lay the sinew down and then I wrap them and then even go back to squeezing them and then rolling them um, with, a, with a glass, with a glass glass. You could get by with just a simple layer of sinew for protection. It'll give you more draw length. It'll help fight string follow. Or you can follow it up with a thick layer. And to have a true composite bow, you know, where that's a good working layer of sinew, you know, it needs to be quite thick, maybe up to 25% of the thickness of the bow. I, I'll, I always do my sinewing in, in one pass. I don't let it dry at all and then go back because you risk delaminating. If I tried to just sinew back this, even if I got it wet or sized it, it would lift up. It's not joined together. If you have to um, go back like that, you don't. You ran out of sinew, so it's kind of drying a little bit, and you have to do it again, you need to wet this and then wrap it so it doesn't dry out. Now wet it some more and wrap it. You need to make it gooey and... Um, what is that? Opaque again, before you have any chance of it um, really bonding well to itself. And so there's some tricks to sinew backing. Doesn't need to look pretty. You don't need to um, process your sinew in a way that um, it's into little hair size things. I mean, there's been uh, some groups of people would do a very rough job where they just kind of pounded the tendons and almost put them on hole. And it, it works, you know. So don't be afraid of sinew backing. If you're in a wet climate, not going to work so much. Um, you know, sinew doesn't like being wet. But this is something to think about. Uh, the last bit I'm going to say is uh, thank you for watching. You know, I've been pumping out a lot of videos lately, but, you know, hopefully you'll get something out of it. I'd rather have three or four people getting something out of it and inspiring them than just, you know, 100,000 views from trolls and people that are just casually watching it for entertainment. I would like to guide you in your journey to become a good bow maker. Thank you and have a great day.